herb culling. Today I'm going to introduce a new paradigm to uh, treat the treatment of addiction. Right now we're having uh, a massive problem with addiction. Probably if you're watching this, you know someone who or yourself is struggling with a chemical dependency to drugs or alcohol. And we've been really engaging in the treatment of drugs and alcohol over the span of 75 years. I mean, AA is over 75 years old. And when we look at our outpatient and treatment models, inpatient and outpatient models, they're really very much based on that AA model, pretty much, which is kind of... Um, saying that we're a, a born, AA says we're born addicted, They're, we blame the alcohol, the drugs, and uh, we blame them as the reason why we become addicted uh, to those substances, though we're born addicted, and that uh, also we're attributed in AA to a character defect, having a character defect as contributing to that. We know uh, since then uh, that uh, there are social and environmental factors that factor into chemical dependency. Um, however, the changes, the most recent changes that we've seen in outpatient treatment have been adding motivational interviewing and harm reduction, um, adding pharmacology such as Suboxone, which is still keeping people addicted. It's just helping them manage that addiction. They are addicted to the opiates in Suboxone. Suboxone is 40% opiate. And so we're not really taking away anyone's addiction. There's Vivitrol or Narcan, which block opiates and alcohol. But if you stop using that, you are still vulnerable to becoming addicted again. And even if you sustain uh, 20 years of sobriety through AA, which 20% of the population do benefit from and are able to sustain sobriety from, if we have a drink or use drugs that we're addicted to, our addiction will come roaring back. So we don't have anything out there in the addiction community that truly treats addiction, what we're really doing is managing our addiction. And in doing so, we have to do this for the rest of our lives. It's a, a lifelong commitment. And the minute we stop or become lax, we become at risk. Also, people are struggling with detox. And getting care because hospitals don't want to do detox anymore and insurance companies don't want to pay. And the reason why is because we relapse and relapse and relapse and they're paying and paying and paying and they don't stop paying. And so they're saying, well, this is just too expensive. We're not going to make any money uh, if we support addiction. So this is a resistance from the insurance companies that people are experiencing and now they're not getting their detox and inpatient and very, very costly outpatient care paid for. The problem there is that we have an 80% relapse rate with our outpatient programs and with the expensive inpatient programs, a 90% relapse rate the first week outside of that therapy. So let's say I know someone who's, um, the insurance company says, well, we're not doing this dance anymore. So they had to um, mortgage their home. And after they mortgaged their home and their child relapsed, they went ahead and cashed in the retirement chips they had. So their lifelong savings is now financing another inpatient stay. And of course, one week out of that, there's another relapse. And now 
the family is devastated financially and their child is still at risk with an addiction. This is a problem. This is, uh, after 75 years, if we look at what we've accomplished in the medical field, physical medicine, wow, we have um, eradicated some diseases. We've made AIDS uh, a thing of the past. HIV is no longer fatal. Um, we've really turned the clock back on some cancers. We have now, um, uh, we don't have to open people up. We can do uh, laparoscopic surgery, completely diminishing the risk of infection. I could go on and on and on with the advances in medicine over the last 75 years. I can't go on and on with the advances that we've made in addiction. And there's a real issue with that. And one of the reasons is that, you know, we've got fantastic um, uh, neuroimaging now that we can facilitate, that can facilitate research. So the addiction community researchers have gotten tremendous grants from pharmacology and from addiction providers to do research. And the problem there is that we're looking at the addicted brain and we're looking at the brain that's already has drugs and alcohol affecting it. And we're seeing, wow, look at all the changes that the brain adapts in chemical dependency. Well, the dependent brain has to react to uh, having, you know, a uh, hundred thousand percent of its dopamine released and uh, its endorphins released. It has to adapt and it closes down receptors and that causes dependence. But the problem here is that we're blaming drugs and alcohol for the addiction. And we're not accounting for the fact that only one in five people have that response to drugs and alcohol. There's a lot of people who can binge on alcohol, who can drink heavily, use drugs and alcohol on a weekend, per se, and not need an eye opener on Monday. In fact, these people can at any point walk away from using drugs and alcohol and not have any ill effects, not go into withdrawal, not need detox, not experience intense cravings to use though they may want to because that's what they do, but they don't need to. That's a big difference. So why is that, that it's only one in five people that develop chemical dependency? For example, if we go to a wedding and the bride and groom come in and we all lift a glass to welcome the bride and groom, we say cheers and we raise our glass of a very addictive substance. Alcohol is as addictive addictive and deadly as heroin. In fact, it's more deadly than heroin. More people die from alcohol-related deaths than heroin. Alcohol is culturally acceptable. And so this seems like a fact that's hard to swallow. But culturally, we've never had an issue with alcohol. We've always accepted alcohol as part of our heritage and our culture. And even in our religions, we celebrate with wine. And we can go back to ancient times and see alcohol being used. So culturally, we accept alcohol, even though it's a deadly substance that's highly, highly addictive. So we celebrate a wedding with alcohol. And the bride and groom come in, and let's say there's 100 people at the wedding, and everyone is drinking a glass of champagne in their honor. Everyone is drinking a highly addictive substance. This highly addictive substance will affect a few people in that they will continue to drink that evening and heavily. But majority of the people will not. They will put that glass down. They may have one or two, but they will be dancing. They will be socializing. They will be having fun, and they will not be hanging out at the bar. Now, what if we put out lines of heroin? 
and welcome the bride and groom by snorting lines of heroin. Of course, this sounds ridiculous, but understand the outcome would be the same. We would not have, we'd have one or two people that would say, wow, where am I going to get some more of this stuff? Can I have your lines? But majority of us, 80% of us at least, will have no interest in using any more of that substance. So the interesting fact is we can look at the research that shows the changes our brain has made, the amazing, amazing amount of changes our brain has changed to adapt to using a substance. And all those things seem not to matter in terms of determining the cause of chemical dependency because there are people that don't have that issue. And unless we understand the difference between those people, we're really not going to understand how to switch dependency on and off, which I can do using EMDR. So in my therapy, we have a different paradigm of addiction. Um, we're not claiming the person is born addicted. In fact, I know for a fact that no one is born addicted despite gene theory because we can parallel gene theory with another theory that can easily show a dis point out the discrepancies in alcohol gene theory. One fact, um, we know that mothers who use heroin and give birth uh, will have babies who are born addicted to heroin and in that case the babies go through withdrawal symptoms and they have to be detoxed that baby is definitely born addicted. However, children born of a child who happens to have a, alcoholic parents, if that mom is not drinking and has never had an issue, uh, you know, didn't start drinking and is sober or has made herself sober for her pregnancy uh, as she should, um, that child is not born needing detox. There's no signs of chemical dependency to say that that child's an alcoholic. There is absolutely zero evidence that we can prove, that medical science can prove, to say that that baby is an alcoholic, despite the fact that they may have uh, four alcoholic grandparents and two alcoholic parents, there's nothing to say that uh, that newborn baby is craving alcohol. And in fact, I bet if we did a test where we gave that baby alcohol versus milk and the baby could choose, the baby would reject the alcohol and choose the milk. And we've done these uh, with rats where we gave rats uh, without choice um, a, an addictive liquid substance instead of water and gave one set of rats water and an addictive substance, put them both through four weeks of detox, and then introduced both substances, water and the addictive substance, uh, to both sets of rats. And lo and behold, the rats that got only the addictive substance chose water. 100% of them chose water. The rats that could learn, that could go back and forth between water and their addictive substance chose the addictive substance. Somehow they learned the difference and that learning caused addiction. This would point to now learning and memory as a key to what is creating chemical dependency. So uh, if we were to look at our memory system, which has to do with learning, we could say that there is a switch in that memory system that switches addiction on and off. And I use, I work with memory when I work with EMDR. I'm working with implicit memory. And I can find that switch. And just like flicking a light switch, we can switch dependency off. And amazingly, there's no detox needed. No detox no long-term expensive therapy, no rehab. 
people who are actively using, who have used that morning, who are going to go into withdrawal when I do the session, experience peace and calm instead of starting to go into withdrawal. This can be made permanent with the addition of continued therapy and using hypnotherapy and EMDR, we can make the remittance of chemical dependency permanent. And even if there are multiple drugs on board that we're targeting, it's the same thing. We can make this permanent, which means they never go through uh, withdrawal. They never need detox. And this includes alcohol, which usually requires a hospital inpatient detox and heroin and um, uh, cocaine and crystal meth. Benzos have been an exception and tobacco has been an exception. These are more complicated dependencies. And I'm not sure why those are more difficult, but they are. Uh, we've had luck uh, with them but the luck is not the same. It's about 50% and that's quite a drop. So um, not the same. But with heroin and alcohol and cocaine and crystal meth, it's been close to 100%. It's a 0.5% relapse rate and the 0.5% are people who have not followed the protocol. So if they had followed the protocol, we probably would be close to 100%. Now this is over years and years, so um, we're not talking about a full week scene here or a one week scene. Um, I've been doing this for over three years, close to four years now, and in four years, uh, this is have how this has been working and we're talking about no more than about 10 weeks of therapy um, with that initial initial switch happening within uh, anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes so we can just turn this off um, targeting implicit memory so let's look at what causes one to have such uh, such an implicit memory that is turning the addiction on, that's turning chemical dependency on. So here's what's happening. When we are growing up, and let's say we have two alcoholic parents, let's look at the gene theory. So the gene theory says, if I have two alcoholic theory, parents, I'm going to be alcoholic. Well, if we look at what causes someone to start storing implicit memory in a pattern that's going to cause addiction, what causes that is fear. Fear being to a newborn, um, the fear of not being held, not being attended to, not being loved, not feeling the warmth and support that I need right when I need it. So my brain changes and the world is not safe to me. That is my perception. It may not be my parents' perception, but is my perception. And as a child, I start to create the only thing that will keep me alive is to start storing memory where I can trigger that memory and trigger a response that is going to create dysregulation so that I can go into fight, flight, and save myself or maybe I may have to shut down my response to stay alive. But the changes in the brain that take place are permanent changes, and one of those changes is this pattern of storing implicit memory whenever we sense distress. So we grow up and we sense distress and we store implicit memory, and we, it becomes a go-to defense mechanism. The same can happen if we've had a loving family and not two alcoholic parents, but loving parents, none of whom who are alcoholic, um, but let's say uh, we party hardy, we use drugs and alcohol without a problem, and we have a skiing accident. And in that skiing accident, it is traumatic. There's a trauma, and I don't have feeling in my legs, and I wake up in, after surgery on a morphine drip 
looking, focusing on the doctor's face as he's telling me that we're not sure the outcome of the surgery, that I may not be able to walk again. Well, there's a trauma, and that trauma is going to shake my brain up, and I am going to start storing implicit memory in that pattern that's going to keep me alive so that I remember this. And I activate a brain that has shut down the emotional regulation that I need, and instead I'm in distress. And I feel that distress because that distress is going to make me go into fight flight and keep me alive. And so the brain adapts to the trauma in a way that's very, very uncomfortable. And the morphine drip is making that very tolerable. I can be comforted by the fact that I may not have legs anymore um, with the fact that I don't have to feel this pain as long as I have that morphine drip. And then I become addicted to the morphine. So the chemical, uh, the implicit memory system is switching on addiction and chemical dependency. Whereas if I didn't have that trauma, I would continue to party hardy and not have an issue with substances. So here's someone who did not have a, the gene problem uh, and became addicted. And I've had, these are real people. This is, I'm not making this up. These are real people that I'm describing to you. So, um, so implicit memory is the switch. And by targeting implicit memory, we can switch addiction off painlessly, effortlessly almost, and no withdrawal, no inpatient treatment, no outpatient treatment, no long-term rehabs, no pharmacology. Um, to me, it's a no-brainer. But this is something that is the future, it's here now, it's a new paradigm, and the addiction community is slow to embrace it. The research community has put up a wall because the addiction community is funded by pharmacology. They don't want this. They're working on a vaccine. They want to make billions and billions of dollars on pharmacology. Docs don't want it because they're prescribers and they depend on that pharmacology. And the addiction community is a billion dollar industry that has repeating customers because of relapse. Except today, sometimes they don't come back. I'm hoping that you will give this controversial idea I'm presenting some thought and not be afraid of it. And be willing to share this video or even comment. Uh, have a discussion with me. Call me. I will debate it with you. I will go through it with you. I want this to become more of a mainstay so that we can help people not spend the rest of their lives fighting with their addiction. Thanks for watching my video. Don't forget to visit my website for more information on implicit memory and my theories. Um, it's at herbcohen.1, spelled out, O-N-E. Don't forget to like and revisit my, my, you can subscribe to revisit my channel. And I'll see you again.